Uh, thank you very much. I'm not going to go through individual introductions with everyone because we all kind of know who everyone is at this point. I'm Hans Nichols. I cover the White House for Axios. We're talking about economic disruptions. We can't talk about economic disruptions without talking about inflation. And I think before we really dive into it, it would be helpful to kind of understand what the inflation rate is. So I'm going to talk to the man with the numbers. I'm going to start with Undersecretary uh, McCord. We got a 7.7 .7 print CPI. But what does inflation feel like from your end, from the, from the purchasing end? Hans, for the department as a whole, we're probably looking at uh, the 5 percent range for this year because CPI does not represent the things that we buy. You know, we're not buying uh, the food and the prescription drugs the way, in the same way a consumer does. We've got things that are much higher like fuel and, and military construction, and then we've got some things that are lower. But it's kind of kind of in the 5 range, which is, which is multiple billions of dollars for us. Well, I mean, just backing it out, five of, someone help me with the math, but five of, five percent of 850 billion is roughly what, 49 billion? I mean, that's a significant number. Right. Well, yeah, we're not up to 850 yet, but we're in the, we're in the 700 range. So yeah, 30, 30, 35 billion. So yeah, significant, significant impact. Yeah. Well, we may get to 850, which is why I want to ask. We may get to 850. We like how you think. Yeah, well, that's why I want to ask, uh, ask Congressman Panetta, who, you know, you understand what the market will bear in your party. Your party's still in control of, of both chambers. Right. What do you think the NDA number will come in at? And then will we'll the omnibus, if we get an omnibus, will be higher or lower? Yeah, look, I, th I think obviously um, it's a lot more than what was requested from the administration back uh, in 2021. But going into this year, uh, what we're seeing is uh, obviously the House passed a version that was substantially more than the administration requested. And then right now the Senate is looking at about close to 850 uh, billion is what they're looking at. But obviously what you got to realize is we're taking into account uh, how inflation is infecting the DOD and DIB, especially with uh, the, the numbers, but also other avenues. I can get into that a little later. Do you, do you share Chairman Smith's sort of confidence that the NDA is going to get done? Uh, I, look, I, I respect Chairman Smith, and, and I think uh, he's very knowledgeable when it comes to not just what's in the NDA, but how Congress works. And I do um, have confidence in the fact that we're going to drop it on Monday and that uh, hopefully we're going to get a vote on uh, Wednesday, most likely. We'll do the rule on Tuesday and then actually have the vote on Wednesday. But, you know, what you got to realize is this isn't a partisan bill. It's a very bipartisan bill. It was out of the House Armed Services Committee and it will be on the, on the floor of the House of Representatives. Uh, to be frank, we can't rely on just Democrats to pass the NDAA. Uh, and that's why it's taken into account why the number has risen, but also knowing that we do need Republicans to pass this bipartisan bill, and we will. Well, Congressman Covert, I saw some head nodding there uh, on the NDA getting passed. You, you, you're confident it gets passed? Yeah, I think so. I think they have a, a pretty good agreement. Uh, on, uh, everything I hear is that the NDA is going to pass next week. I'm not as hopeful on the omnibus, but I'm working hard on it. We'll see what happens. Well, walk me through the omnibus then. Where do you think the number ends up at? And, and what are the consequences if we just do a CR for, you know, the, for, the, for the rest of the fiscal year? Well, it, it's, it, doing a CR is not good, it's, uh, especially for the Department of Defense. Uh, they've never had to operate on a year-long CR. We don't want to start now. We need to get this done. Uh, that's our job. So we need to get together and, uh, and, and do this. I, I'm probably looking at the Senate, you know, trying to come together with some uh, workable numbers where they can get 10 votes in the, uh, on the Republican side. I think they're working toward that to get a top line number. I think that top line number is what uh, Jimmy was talking about. And if they do that, then we can start working the bill. It's not, you can't just do an appropriation bill in a day. You got to read out the bill, write it out. It takes a little while. So uh, even if we came up with a top line number next week, it's, I doubt if we can get it done by December 16th. So we're going to have to do a short-term extension. And that, and that put, you're at 850 as well, just so I understand. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, the Senate numbers are, how they calculate numbers are different right. than, the, than the House, because they uh, have the nuclear weapons programs and the rest of that. Uh, Secretary Del Toro, I'll just, if we yeah. do a CR, and you've got to live under CR for, for the next nine months, how the, challenging is that? It's very challenging. It's extremely challenging for the Department of the Navy and all the military services and the entire Department of Defense. And the impact of a continuing resolution that would go on hypothetically for six or 12 months 
uh, has far greater impact, actually, than the inflation rates themselves. So in the Department of Navy alone, for example, your long CR would cost about $22 billion. It would be $7 billion in the SCN accounts, $2 billion in the military personnel accounts. Right. O&M would be about $4.2 billion, $4.4 billion in procurement. RDT&E, which we've been talking about throughout this entire conference, and the importance of it, would be about $2 billion. And in military construction alone, we would have to cancel 22 projects in the Department of the Navy at a cost of about $2.4 billion. So when you look at the, earlier we were talking about, you know, Secretary Austin was talking about taking care of our people. We would have to actually eliminate a lot of the programs that we hope we're going to be putting into place over the course of the next year to take care of our people and their families. How quickly would you have to do that? Is the, the minute we get, uh, we're in CR territory, you have to move by January, February? We essentially can't start any new projects. And so we're allotted to continue operations based on the previous financial year, but we really can't start any new projects. And we put it into a place in accordance, you know, collaborating with our friends in the Congress, a lot of new programs that would benefit, you know, districts across the country and more importantly, our service members. Tom, I see you again, nodding vigorously. Yeah. What does a CR mean for you? Yeah, exactly what uh, the secretary said. I mean, delay and new starts, delays, co uh, discontinuity and funding at, at a time. You've heard it all day. I mean, we are in a, in a, at a point in time where it's about, let's get some of these systems fielded. Let's make sure we're, you know, channeling investments to prepare for the pacing challenge that we're facing. Um, you know, how do we backfill some of the stockpiles that have been depleted in, the, in support of Ukraine? And so now's the time to, you know, continue to move. I'm going to ask a follow-up on what you think the inflation rate is. But before I do, I'm going to remind everyone that if you want to submit a question for later on, there's the RDF app. You get, an, you get a premium if you buy a vest for down the line. It's not just for reporters that forgot their suit tops at home. So you get a, you get a premium. But if, everyone wants to put a, if anyone wants to put a question in. Uh, do you agree that the inflation is 5%? Does it feel like 5% for industry? It does. It does. I mean, we feel, I thought we you disagree. I wanted you to go higher or lower. We can't, oh, all, no. we can't all agree here. If, I feel it. Our workforce feels it, right? It's labor and material, and then labor, we're, you know, we're, we're seeing wages start to creep up. Anyone who's had wait, uh, union negotiations over the course of the last year is feeling it. Um, you know, on the material side, we're seeing it, seeing it in pricing agreements as they're renewed. I mean, we, are, we have the benefit of long-term pricing agreements as do m uh, many in our industry, but sooner or later those expire and we're going to be seeing uh, yeah. increased prices in the process. So that, that just means we're not through sort of pricing out inflation, right? If you have these long-term conflicts, we, it, it could go up for in, in the future. That's right. It, take, it will take some time as inflation works its way through the, these you know, the periods of these supply agreements. Congressman Cover, does 5% seem right to you? Well, it depends on what we're talking about. You know, the, um, obviously fuel prices in the last year were more than 5%. Food prices were more than 5%. You know, if you take a look, I guess overall, you, you may have that at or close to 5%. The, the biggest issue when we start this process, say hopefully we get an omnibus bill done and we start the next year appropriation, we come up with a realistic inflation number that we have to deal with is we put together the appropriation bill for next year. And uh, if we believe it's closer to six, if the Fed indicates that, then we should deal with that number and uh, not come up with a, a lower number if the administration may say it's gonna be 3% or, or 4%, because you, we gotta deal in reality and not in, in fake numbers. Well, then I'll, I'll toss that to the comptroller. You, have, you, you use a chain, you know, GDP chain inflator, right? You have an index. Correct. Um, we, when we put that next number out, and uh, I mean, you said 5%, because I think your last one assumed 3.9%, if I'm, if I'm correct. Yeah, we actually have about seven big components that we use. We use inflators for fuel, for food, for housing, for healthcare, for uh, GDP, for most things. Um, so we, we have a number, of different, and then of course, employment, con employment cost index for uh, pay raises. So we have a, a basket of things we need to use. We have to work those with OMB. We, we ultimately agree, we have to agree with them on what goes in the budget. Uh, and I think it's important for us to, to work, as, as Congressman Calvert said, iteratively with the committees as, as uh, we get new data, new information, and as it unfolds, to try and get to the best numbers we can at the end of the day. But we have, we have a whole basket of things we're looking at, some of which, one or two of which we know now what's going to go in the budget, some of which are still going to be given to us by OMB a little bit later. And we get that number earlier in the next quarter? Possibly still in this quarter. Okay. But yeah, within, within weeks, I think we're going to have all the numbers that we're going to be using for the 24 budget. Obviously, for 23, the, the, the world will continue to evolve in execution. 
it's going to be harder if, if we get the omnibus finished this month, as, as we're all hoping, then, then we're all kind of locked in and we'll, it will be a little harder to adjust for the rest of this year. Does the delay on, on NDAA, does that, does that hinder your ability to come up with a budget for FY 2024? How much of a challenge was that? I think, I think the challenge for us is that, um, as we saw last year, when, when things start to stack up, as looks like it's maybe happening here, that, that there's, a, there's an impact back on the back end on putting the next budget out. I think the White House you know, would like to have some clarity about what happened in 23 before you put out a 24. So it's not the NDA per se, it's more based on the appropriation, but in both cases, you know, uncertainty leads to further uncertainty delays, then leads you to start slow and finish, finish later the next time as well. So getting back on track, which is something that we focused a lot on this fall with OMB, is a little bit at risk now if we can't get, you know, can't get closure on everything this month. On the uncertainty question, Tom, I mean, in some ways it seems as though if we don't actually get appropriations, the uncertainty, there's going to be a premium. There's going to be some sort of price premium that's going to be built in to whatever, whatever systems you're offering. Is that a fair assumption or? No, I think what uncertainty does, it makes it difficult to make the investment decisions that we're making in order to make sure that the kinds of things we're doing are aligned around the strategies of the national defense. And so, um, you know, we, we've, every year, I mean, we, this is like year 12 out of 13 where we've had a CR. And so that uh, is, is sort of starts getting built into the, you know, the expectation. It's unfortunate, especially at a time like this when, you know, speed is of the essence. But, you know, I, wouldn't, I, I would say it's more about uncertainty of uh, are, we, are we putting our investments in the right place or are we putting those at the right levels? Just, w Secretary Del Toro, on, on sort of the, the human side of inflation, do you feel like your person, is it, have you seen it come through with, like, retention? Is it, is it a challenge for, you know, for sailors and Marines uh, to, to make ends meet? A absolutely so. In all my travels, and I've spent a lot of time this past year talking to sailors and Marines across the board about the impact that inflation's having. It's having an impact, obviously, every time they get in the car to drive to their grocery store or go to the hospital. It's having an impact on them being able to find affordable housing in the local marketplace as well, too, which has drawn a lot of them back on base. And so we've had to actually look at investing you know, more resources into base housing, uh, more resources into family housing, uh, because it's just so tough to find rental homes and homes to buy out in the economy. And so, you know, Secretary Austin has been focused on this like a laser beam, along with uh, Gil Cisneros and all the service secretaries to try to come up with, you know, human factor improvements that we can make in terms of uh, some of the low-hanging fruit. How can we uh, uh, adjust COLAs, for example, to help them out better? Um, Batcher uh, BAH across the board. Uh, to give more money in the, in, in the hands of sailors and even look at targeted pay raises, for example. But again, many of these programs, these new programs, can't go into effect unless we actually have an NDAA and an appropriations bill. So we could talk about it all we want, but the more we delay, the harder it's going to be on our service members across the board. And they don't understand the complexities of, you know, all the legislation on Congress and everything else. It's really hurting their bottom line. Congressman Calvert, I, I saw I want to jump in. If I may, Congressman Panetta, I will. Um, just, just briefly, um, that's exactly why we took the steps that we did in this year's NDAA. 4.6% uh, of wages increase across the board, 4.2% on basic uh, housing allowance, and then when it comes to the basic needs allowance, we increase the percentage of the poverty rate that you need to have in order to get it from 130 to 150%. There are also discussions in the House bill of putting in uh, increasing the moving expenses and then providing an inflation uh, quote unquote bonus mm -hmm. uh, for certain members as well. So we're taking that into account in the NDAA in regards to how inflation is infecting our personnel. You know, it seems like, just to take a step back, a lot of the, you know, when you listen to the Biden administration, they talk about reshoring. They talk about industrial policy. That's a big part of what's motivating the, the, the sort of impetus on chips. And it seems to me that reshoring things is also going to cost a lot more money. And if you bring supply chains closer, they may be more resilient, but they may be more expensive. And Congressman Covert, I could just start with you on this. At what point do those work at cross purposes? Well, as the Secretary pointed out, you can't, uh, you can't enter into any new contracts to bring those supply chains back into the United States. Uh, by some estimates, uh, operating under a continuing resolution costs the Department of Defense about $2 billion a week. Uh, that's money just out the door. So that has a bigger effect than, than the inflation rate. 
And so that's one of the reasons why we need to get this uh, appropriation bill uh, completed. I, you know, I think there's a lot of bipartisan support to do that, uh, and we need to do that as, uh, as soon as possible, or, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to be a very Merry Christmas. Well, what are the holdups in your party? Um, it's probably the non-defense discretionary spending. Is, the the parity issues. Is, is that uh, needs to come down. Uh, the Hyde language uh, needs to come back in. That's a, an important issue uh, for, for our folks. Uh, it's very similar to what we went through last year in, in the appropriation negotiation. Uh, if I think we get to that, I think we can you know, rapidly come to a top line number and then start uh, working on reading these bills out and getting it done by the end of the year. If you and your colleague, Mr. Panetta, got together and just pencils and papers, how long would it take you to figure uh, it out? I mean, Jimmy, hell, we'd work out in 15 minutes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, let, me, let me just give you an antidote. Um, Talking about Christmas Eve, it's never pleasant when um, we pass a CR and I have to go have dinner with the former budget chair who uh, <laughs> passed a budget every year consistently and then balanced the budget as OMB director. So definitely not a pleasant Christmas Eve when we have to have a CR. So that's one of the reasons why I'm motivated to make sure we pass this budget. And, and the point two is uh, China doesn't operate under a CR. No. Nor do they have to worry about a Congress, so they, uh, they're, they're going to continue uh, operating the way they're operating, and uh, so they probably celebrate our problems that yeah. we're having. Well, that, that gets at this and Hans, I'm sorry, Please. if I could just add Please. to that. You know, we shouldn't minimize that factor at all. You know, China doesn't operate under CRs, and, and so everything we've been talking about in this conference for the last two days, uh, it's good talk, but if we can't execute on it, that's all it is, is talk. And so that's why it's imperative that we actually move out fast, that we can actually start investing in all the technology programs and all the shipbuilding programs and space and cyber and everything else that we need to counter and deter China from doing what it wants to do. I mean, I think deterrence only really works if the Chinese believe that we're serious, right? I mean, deterrence, it's in, it's in the eyes of, eyes of a beholder. What more would you, and I'll start with you, Tom, would you like to see from either a defense strategy or on the appropriations side to really let the Chinese know yeah. that this isn't just talk, this isn't just another you know, summit, this is real. Yeah, I think for them, particularly given the culture, is continuity, resolve, you know, sort of just a measured, continual improvement, continual introduction of new technologies that become, a, you know, they recognize as a deterrent. And so it's, it is, I think we, we show signs of weakness when we're sort of up and down and back and forth and there's not this continuity of uh, purpose. But there's no big project. There's no big, I mean, we're here under the, you know, the wings of uh, the Air Force One that Reagan threw sure. around when he was dreaming up SDI. Like, what's the, what's the modern SDI to let the well, China? We just rolled out yesterday down in Palmdale, not far from here, Fine. in yeah. attendance at the, the B-21 bomber rollout. That got China's attention. I think there are a number of programs uh, in the Secretary's area. We got the Columbia class submarine, and that is a force to reckon with. And so these are programs of magnitude and of that uh, China will take note. Mr. Secretary, do you we're not this? slowing down, and I'm not working so hard for nothing. I mean, we got Columbia, we got Virginia payload module, we got new Virginia class submarines coming out on the Marine Corps side. We've got 16 different major programs that we're investing in: robotics and AI and quantum theory and all sorts of things. We got DDG Flight 3, which can now do ballistic missile defense and air defense at the same time. Um, so there's no shortage of investments and real commitment to deterring China from what it wants to do in modernizing our, our Navy. And the same thing applies across the Army and the Air Force as well. Without actually explaining quantum theory, could you explain quantum theory to me? Sure. It's using computer science to be able to do things better than human beings can actually do on their own. Does that require real investment? Of course it does. Everything, nothing's cheap, right? Nothing's free. Of course, it requires normal investment because you're actually you know, advancing the pace of technology when you need scientists and researchers and data analysts that are, are very expensive. And you've got to invest in training all those individuals, all those young Americans, to learn all these things. Well, let, let me just take a step back and ask, if the 850 is the number, is 850 a number that's serious enough? And I know that the, compartment, the components matter. And we'll just go down the line. But is 850 a big enough number, given inflation, given how it's going to be caked in, to let the Chinese take deterrence more seriously, to force them to take deterrence more seriously? Well, if we do this immediately, uh, it, it, like I said, it's costing us $2 billion a week. And uh, I, I'm sure uh, that the, the department would love for us to get this done soon. 
and uh, I'm sure they'll be very happy with 850 if uh, we can get this done as rapidly as possible. 850? I, th I think it's less about the exact number. It's more about the direction year over year. And if they're, they've watched the trend in recent years, that's the kind of trend that gets their attention. It's, at this point, just real quickly, if we could bring up that, there's a slide that shows sort of the bipartisan support for increased, um, increased defense, uh, defense spending. And what's remarkable to me about that is just how it was expected if you'd taken this a generation ago, there'd be a greater delta between the Republicans and Democrats. And you just look at the overall number, and it's quite high. I mean, where it's 76% want favor increased defense spending. But, Excuse me, Mr. Secretary, I cut you off there. Yeah, uh, uh, Hans, I mean, I'm not sure that Michael will agree with me or not, but I'll take $850 billion for the Department of the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> How are you going to allocate it? All Pacific? A little bit, a little bit of Atlantic? Controller's not smiling. <laughs> Hans, I think you were, on, you were on a good point, kind of the, the way you set this up. Uh, um, you asked what, what would have an effect on the Chinese, and effects are really what you're looking for. Like the, the least, it's interesting to me as a comptor, how much are we gonna spend, your top line question, but what's more interesting is what you spend it on, as we've discussed, but what you really wanna know is what effect do you get? And on deterrence, you can have an idea, a little bit of an idea with, with the, what you observe, how well it would work in war fighting. Of course, you don't wanna actually have to get to the point to find that out. So, impact on China, I, I, I think, you're looking for the effects is the right question rather than, rather than the top line being the, ultimate, the, the, you know, the primary thing you look at. Second thing I would say, sort of a lesson learned from Ukraine, is, uh, what, is what is working in Ukraine? It's not just, the, it's not just the, the security assistance defense part, it's humanitarian assistance, economic assistance, sanctions. So China plays a big game even bigger than that, right? And so I think we saw with the CHIPS Act that, that you're gonna need to go, not just what you do in our department, as important as that is, but but you need to have that sustained look, the focus, and looking across all the pieces on the chessboard here, which, which I think is, is an important part of this as well. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Ukraine, because Ukraine is where we're, we don't, the, the polling isn't great on this, but we're starting to see some divergence in the parties. And, you know, Mr. Calvert, it's, you know, you, the, your fellow California lawmaker, potential speaker McCarthy, has kind of sent some mixed messages on how much support there will be within the Republican conference for additional Ukraine allocations. Could you tell me where you think he is, where you think the party will end up, and is, is there a way just to avoid this all and do an omnibus and plus it up for the year? Well, I can't speak for uh, the speaker-elect, but uh, I can say that uh, there is support, I think, by the majority of uh, members uh, on the Republican side to assist Ukraine. Uh, no U.S. troops. Uh, we, haven't put, uh, we haven't lost one U.S. troop in Ukraine. They're asking for the weapons to defend themselves, and they've made tremendous progress in defeating the Russian military machine and have done irreparable damage uh, to the Russian military, uh, which is, uh, in my mind, a good thing. And uh, it's setting back uh, Putin and his ambitions for a long, a long time. People have to realize that if uh, he had been successful in Ukraine, uh, there was little doubt that he would have taken Moldova and potentially the Baltics and then eventually moved to Romania and Poland. He wants to rebuild what, and reconstruct what was the Soviet Union. Yes, sir. M Mr. Panetta, do you, do you agree? Uh, I mean, yeah. Do you, I mean, do you, uh, and, and I guess what I'm asking you to agree with or critique is the idea that the Republican conference is going to continue to, 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 to plus up Ukraine funding. Um, look, I, I think there are a majority of my Republican colleagues who do believe in what is going on in Ukraine in regards to not just what the Ukrainians are doing, but what we're doing to support the Ukrainians defend themselves and defend their democracy. So that's what gives me hope uh, if we don't. But obviously, what we need to make sure is that we pass it this year. We need to make sure that there's that plus up passed this year. I think that would cure any sort of question that you had about uh, the party. I guess I don't really think the issue is, is there a majority in the Republican conference? The question is, are, are there a handful of Republicans that will refuse to, to, to let this go forward and potentially hold McCarthy hostage? I think we have people on both sides that would like to hold uh, either side hostage, uh, quite frankly. Um, but uh, we have to continue to move on. And uh, I have no doubt that uh, Speaker-elect McCarthy will be Speaker McCarthy on January 3rd, uh, and uh, we'll move forward. But in the meantime, we need to get this, uh, I think, this appropriation bill completed. Uh, obviously, there's going to be some disagreements within my conference. Uh, but uh, we've, uh, we have a responsibility to get our job done, and we need to, to get it done as soon as possible. As, as long as we're sort of on potential political disagreements and, and cultural issues, 
seems pretty clear that on the NDAA, there's a holdup on the vaccine. And should the vaccine mandate be taken out? Um, we've, uh, I, there's, there've been separations, it's contentious. It seems it's a, re a priority for Senate GOP. Well, I'll make the point that uh, the authorizers do the policy, we just pay the bill. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'll, I'll throw it to the authorizer. Yeah. Look, I, I think going into it, you have to look at the current policies, you have to have the vaccine before you go into the, to the military. Uh, and right now, I think looking at science, looking at the spread of vaccines that are out there, I think there's room for that to be changed. Okay, so you, you envision a, a change on that, dialing it back and, and, giving, and giving Mitch and, and Senate Republicans a little bit of quarter there. Based on how uh, the disease itself has evolved, based on how the vaccines have basically become more prevalent, people are more, uh, can, can withstand uh, an infection, I think you're going to see uh, some sort of dialing back of that first time going into it. Now, whether or not there's some discussions as to whether or not you need the boosters uh, to go along, that's something that has yet to be seen. Okay. But this is solvable to you. This is something that, this shouldn't hold up the NDA, the issue I, of, of, of taking out the vaccine oh. mandates. Um, I, look, from con Congress's part, I think that's where we're headed. Okay. Whether, or not, whether or not the DOD has a different angle, uh, they're going to have to answer. Well, that's, that's what I well, see the secretary jumping a, in. Yeah, <clears throat> from a military readiness perspective, I would hope that we don't mix apples and oranges. And it's certainly for the Congress to figure out from a policy perspective. But vaccines aren't necessary for combat readiness. And passing the NDA is essential for our nation's combat readiness. And if you care about what's happening in Taiwan, you got to care about what's happening in Ukraine as well, too. So from my perspective, I think we should pass the NDA and deal with the issue of COVID shots separately. And just decouple them and, and move forward. I would hope so. Yeah. Well, it seems as though everyone is, you know, there's a, there's a broad agreement here on that and this, the, the prospects and the step forwards. To, to move it back toward the national defense strategy and, and potential threats, um, you know, we have a, and this is a Navy question for you, Mr. Secretary, we obviously have a carrier based premium Navy. If those, if you got a report in the last 72 hours that suggested that those carriers were not safe in the Western Pacific, how would you think about a potential conflict with China without your carriers? Well, let me just say that for as long as we've had, our nation has had a Navy, it's operated within the weapon engagement zone. That's not to say that we should be careless about how we operate those carriers, absolutely not. And our tactics and procedures today actually pay a lot of attention to how we're going to employ them. But there's no question in my mind that the carrier is the number one platform to project power, not just in a potential scenario against Taiwan or any other adversary, quite frankly, but in any national security crisis that we may find ourselves. It always has been the number one platform where the president has asked, where's the nearest carrier? And it still is today. And also the potential use of carriers across with our allies and partners is essential. Just last month, we had five simultaneous uh, operational carriers at sea operating together basically in the Mediterranean, projecting power as, you know, as one with all our allies and partners. And it is really, really impressive. Last year, we had a similar situation in the South China Sea, which were, we had uh, three simultaneous carriers operating together and the Japanese uh, ship Izumo as well. So new threats to carriers aren't going to change the centrality of the carrier-based model? I don't think so. I think uh, we're always reanalyzing how we're going to fight the carrier, how we're going to operate the entire carrier strike group, along with amphibious uh, strike groups as well, too, and their essential mission in controlling the straits and other essential missions. But they will be at the core of the United States Navy for a long time to come. Mr. Yeah, Hans, I would just add, that, I mean, that's, that issue is not unique to the Navy, right? We, we have the same issue with, with land-based air, with space assets now. There's no such thing as risk-free, you know, assets that are going to be essential to in, in, if there were a conflict with China. So we have to look at those issues all, all the time. Yeah, and obviously uh, China believes that carriers are valuable. They're building them. Yeah. yeah. So uh, are, we're you, seeing uh, they'll probably go to a nuclear carrier here soon. You, everyone seems to be describing a more risky, a world where we accept more risk in potential conflict. Uh, maybe it's the same amount of risk, but it's like there's a not insignificant, insignificant amount of risk. And I'll just start with you, Mr. Panetta. Is, is, is the American public ready for that kind of conflict, that kind of risk? I think what we've heard throughout, at least what I have heard or interpreted throughout the panels that I've listened to today, starting with Chairman Smith this morning, it's about the narrative. 
It's about making sure that people understand not only the threat, but the consequences of what can happen uh, if there is uh, any sort of invasion of Taiwan. Uh, and so I think it's making sure that we do our job explaining and talking about it. I just heard my uh, colleague and good friend, Representative Moulton, talk about basically, you know, when we were out on the campaign trail recently, uh, you didn't hear people talking about China. That wasn't at the forefront of what people are worried about right now. We need to do a better job letting them know how much of a threat it is, but more importantly, the consequences of what happens if there is sort of invasion and what will that will entail from our part. Mr. Secretary. And Hans, I couldn't agree with Congressman Moore. And, and we also need to let China principally understand the consequences of their actions as well, too, and violating um, their actions and you know, not in accordance with the norms of international behavior. Um, we want to prevent conflict with China. We want to do it militarily. We want to do it economically. We want to do it diplomatically. We want to put all the, the forces of government to bear so that China understands that the cost of going to conflict, the cost of going to war, is insurmountable, and the impact on their own economy, on the global economy, would be disastrous for all. We, that's how we deter China from doing what it needs to do, in my humble opinion. Tom, where, where are you on the horizons on these? I mean, I know you've talked about this in the past on how we should be thinking about where we are in terms of you know, preparing for China, where we are in the immediate short term. Walk me through what your horizon is on China and how much runtime we need. Yeah, sure. I mean, I very difficult to pinpoint a date. There are those who have uh, have placed it later in this decade, but I think it's on a uh, Tuesday. It's on a Tuesday. It's a Tuesday. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, you know, in the, as we think about the national defense strategy, right? The longer term version of that, the, the dimension of that that's longest term is the is the so-called challenge, pacing challenge. Uh, but when uh, February twenty fourth happened this year, I mean, you saw in the national defense strategy the the Russia as an acute threat, sort of near and clear and present threat. Uh, that created a horizon, actually a couple of horizons for us. One, in industry, one is how do we, um, what, what can we get to Ukraine in as quickly as possible, right? And so that, uh, and then immediately after that, what is it, uh, what will it take to uh, backfill some of the stockpiles that, uh, that are drawn down? Uh, there's also the thought and the strategy around what is, what is the defense of Eastern Europe look like you know, uh, some handful of years from now, maybe in the medium term. And okay. So I think there's a strategy. And it's like five, to, just so I understand your, your horizon yeah, on that? Yeah, I mean, they're both. Okay. Yeah. So you know, it just it puts, uh, it puts a national defense strategy into a, a few horizons that give us all an opportunity to plan and, and make investments accordingly. It, it seems like inflation took the, you know, it took a lot of people by surprise. Some people saw it beforehand. Some people saw it. A little bit later, I see the congressman smiling on that. But it does sort of reveal to what extent the, you know, the industrial base is, is vulnerable to shocks. And I'm just wondering what other shocks potentially you see around the corner. I mean, you know, when, during the financial crisis, we had a lot of black swan talk. Right? What are the black swans we're not, I mean, we're here having these big thoughts. What are the black, black swans we're not thinking about in terms of our industrial base and defense production? Well, my opinion, um, just my opinion, if, if the economy uh, goes south worse than we may believe, uh, you know, the, uh, obviously I, I, what happened yesterday, it seems like the, the, the Fed may decide to raise rates at a higher level than they were talking about earlier. Uh, obviously that has an effect on the housing market, has an effect on the entire economy. Uh, that, that could be, uh, that could be difficult for this country. And so I hope, uh, although my own man would say hope is not a planning strategy, but uh, uh, it's like the inflation number. I, I think a lot of us in the business community knew that the inflation number a year ago was gonna be a hell of a lot higher than what people were talking about. And it's because you saw it on the wages side or you saw it on the? Oh, I, you know, I was, I'm in the restaurant, used to be in the restaurant business. And <laughs> you know, I don't know how, you know, you put a menu together nowadays, you price of produce, price of, labor price of everything has just gone sky high, price of fuel. Uh, so um, that has an effect on everything we do. Uh, and uh, that has an effect on this economy. And uh, we have not gone through the ramifications of it yet, I believe. And um, so we'll see what happens here in the next, uh, next few months. But uh, but just so just so I'm clear, you're, you're concerned about an economic slowdown, contraction, recession. Yeah. In the, in the effects that has on resourcing the military. Right. But that, that seems within the realm of something this country has dealt with before, right? 
Uh, yes, but it, uh, especially now, is going to have a significant impact. Uh, it's more difficult, I think, to get the resources together to, to do what we need to do. And if uh, we go into a significant recession, that's just going to make it more difficult. Mr. Secretary, I think. I think another issue that's incredibly important for our government to tackle uh, you know, head on is the labor shortage. And I think, you know, certainly not my swim lane, but it appears to me I suffer the consequences, obviously, because of the impact on the industrial base, the impact on even our, uh, private, uh, our public shipyards, for example, just trying to find, you know, competent people to do the work. Um, and so I think we're going to have to look, I think, hopefully in a bipartisan way across Congress, this is an issue which the you know, U.S. Chamber of Commerce supports as well, too. Look for ways to bring more labor into this country, whether it be legal immigration, whether it be more aggressive work uh, visa programs, for example, where we can bring more workers into the United States to do the blue-collar kind of jobs that are needed in our shipyards and across a lot of our other uh, low-tech uh, manufacturing industries. Mr. Panetta. No, he's spot on. Look, and, and that's why we've, uh, look, I come from the central coast of California and proudly represent that area. We have agriculture as number one industry. Uh, that's a job no American will do. Uh, therefore, we need to make sure that we have people who are willing to come here, work here, and do it legally. And so that's why we passed the Foreign Workforce Modernization Act. But many of the issues that the secretary just hit on, it, it tells us that it's not just about agriculture where we're missing labor, restaurants, hospitality, uh, uh, these contracting jobs, mi many jobs, and, and also looking at skilled labor too. But if I could, let me just, uh, on the black swan question, um, I think rare earth materials are a real issue. Uh, and what I mean by that is they all go through China. And looking at our supply chain and dealing with rare earth materials, 80% of it goes through China. If you look at graphite, that's 100%. If you look at uh, the solar chips for, or the solar wafers for solar panels, 100% go through China. If you look at lithium ion, 80% go through China. Let's say if you want to go to another country, like you're looking for cobalt, uh, and you go to Congo, well, that company that extracts that, uh, the cobalt is owned by China, a Chinese company. Uh, you want to go to the one country here that it deals with the most uh, extraction of rare earth materials, uh, MP materials, I think it's called. They're half owned by China. Um, this is an issue that I think we should be paying more attention to when it comes to the extraction, the processing of rare earth materials and realizing that if we have to one day immediately uh, decouple uh, from China, this is going to be an issue not just for our military now, but for p potential efforts to decarbonize going forward. And that's understandable why the president and this administration use the Defense Production Act yeah. to uh, focus on these types of issues when it comes to rare earth materials. I mean, the, the and if I just connect please. what, what uh, my colleague Secretary Del Toro said to, to the Black Swan issue, I, you know, the, lab the labor market tightness and supply chain issues, I, I don't know if you could call a black swan at this point because we know we're going to deal with them. Both COVID demonstrated that and Ukraine has also demonstrated that some of these supply chain issues and, and tight labor market are, are causing us problems on the black swan side in addition to what Congressman Panetta said. I think we did show that we're fairly vulnerable to pandemics. I, we didn't react really well as a society to that. And I would add, you know, you can never rule out cyber, although we, we're working hard across the interagency and across private sector on, on uh, protections on cyber, you can't rule out, I think, that as a, as a major disruption, hopefully a short-term one if it happened. You know, to me, one of the issues was decoupling, which maybe the public hasn't fully priced in yet, is just how expensive it will be and how reshoring these jobs. There will be more jobs in this country, but things will be more expensive. And if I could, and then at the same time, we're asking, we're asking our, you know, industry to do more with less. We want them to do it faster, uh, and, and then we want to do it cheaper. And it seems to me like something in that equation has to give. Right? Those aren't all possible. So if we do have a big reshoring movement and decoupling happens not suddenly but gradually, what effect will that have on costs for, for you and other, other primes? Yeah, I mean, I think you asked this question earlier. I mean, I think there is a trade-off between reshoring and cost, but I mean, it's the same as any trade-off where you're trying to mitigate risk. The mitigation of risk does not come for free. And so by onshoring and reducing your risk and vulnerability on, uh, in your supply chain, you're, you're gonna, there, will, there will be a premium to be paid for that. I mean, I think the idea is to make that as, an efficient, as efficient a premium as possible and find ways to offset costs in other areas in order to you know, afford the risk. Con Congressman Calvert, is the country ready for that? Uh, 
We found out, look, uh, Apple's moving uh, their uh, telephone uh, assembly out of, uh, out of China. I'm not quite sure where they're going to move it to, but the uh, automation uh, in the United States, I think have, we have an opportunity to move a lot of uh, manufacturing back into this country uh, and uh, to uh, take advantage of automation. Uh, we've seen in, in the, for instance, if you go up to the Tesla plant up in Fremont, you know, how they're how they've automated the development of the automobile. It's just uh, very impressive. And how we do logistics is all automated. And if we can uh, bring the chip manufacturing industry to the, in the United States with these new chip manufacturing plants that are going to be built, uh, a lot of automation in that. So uh, that, I think, uh, I think that's our future. And we need so you to, think it'll be mostly painless? What's that? You think it'll be painless? No, it's not going to be painless. It's going to take some investment. It's going to take some uh, that's why the CHIP Act's passed. I didn't, wasn't 100% for that. It kind of expanded over the period of time. Uh, but uh, we need to bring that, we need to bring those industries back. And uh, during the, during that process, it's going to be, it's, it's going to, it's, it's going to be some pain involved, but we've got to get it done. Congressman Panetta, I see you. Uh, no, I could, nodding in agreement. Well, no, once again, completely agree with Kenna. It's, uh, but people got to realize it's not just the chips, it's the Chips and Science Act. So it's not just $52 billion for manufacturing. It's close to a, over $200 billion for innovation uh, and artificial intelligence. So it was a significant bipartisan bill um, that obviously I think we're very proud of, but was needed at this point, especially when it comes to sort of, uh, like you said, onshoring uh, and, and, and making up for um, what we haven't done uh, in the last decades. When you guys take a big step back and look at, you know, where policy is right now, what's one thing that keeps you up at night? I mean, there's been a lot of China talk. It seems like China is like an uninvited guest at this, at this forum. There's a lot of talk about China, but what's keeping everyone up at night? And Tom, I'll just start with you because you're closest to me. Yeah, I think it's, you know, you, you mentioned the black swan. I think, um, you know, I define that as any sort of material discontinuity in the supply and demand balance. And, uh, you know, we pandemic, uh, we faced into that. I mean, certainly Ukraine uh, created a, a tremor there. Uh, you know, if, if we saw, you know, Russia decide to take action against a NATO country, you know, if China, you know, we woke up and, and heard that China had invaded Taiwan. I mean, these are the sorts of, you know, sort of um, step ups in action that, uh, are, you know, we have to ask ourselves, are we prepared for that? And what will we do in response? Sir? Uh, any war uh, is, is bad for, uh, for not just this country, but for the entire world. And so I guess anything that keeps me up at night is, uh, is a conflict with, uh, with China. And the way to keep that from happening is to have the deterrence that we need to have to make sure that doesn't happen. No one wants a war, and uh, so that, as Ronald Reagan would say, uh, uh, weakness is provocative, and uh, we need to prevent that from happening. Mr. Secretary. There's a lot of things that keep me up at night. Um, there's certainly a lot of national security challenges out there. So what I often think about is how can I, as a secretary, sort of invigorate our Department of the Navy, both the Navy and Marine Corps, to think differently about the challenges that we face and embrace technology as it's been evolving over the past 10 to 20 years in a more productive way so that we can actually reap a greater return on investment for the American taxpayers. So just this past year, for example, we launched a Marine Innovative Innovation Center to think more strategically and innovatively about how we embrace these transformative changes in the private sector that we need, whether it's you know, the proliferation of LEO satellites or quantum or AI or anything else. And I'm also pleased to announce as well today here that uh, we're going to open up a, a Navy Innovation Center at the Navy Postgraduate School in Monterey, California as well. Who's, um, who's, whose district is that in? Is that, I'm sorry? Whose district is that in? Is that, uh, I, I think it's Congressman Panetta's <laughs> district. Uh, but uh, you know, the Navy Postgraduate School is the right place to do that. We have to invest in our professional military education. It's something that I've been deeply devoted to these past 18 months, so that we could actually build the type of war, lead, uh, war fighters that not only know how to fight, but think strategically about how to avoid conflicts and when, if we have to go into conflict. You know, if I if I if I uh, could not sleep at night because of a, you know there was a problem somewhere in the Defense Department, I would never sleep. But I think we we. We are, we are 
in a pretty good spot in, in DOD, I think, for the things that we're trying to do for the nation. So I, my bigger worry is really beyond uh, the national defense to our cohesion as a society and our ability to kind of stay focused for a long-term whole of government uh, challenge that we have with China. So it goes from things like the CHIPS Act and following up on it as well as things like hypersonics that are in DOD's lane. But it's, it's broader than that, and it's do we have the, the, uh, you know, the, the vision and, and the cohesion as a society to keep after these long-term challenges. I think we're, we're going to be fine at DOD, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah. Obviously, let me thank Secretary Del Toro for that uh, uh, amazing announcement. Uh, look, there, we, we on the Central Coast, as you can tell, I'm very proud of it. We have a lot of treasures there, uh, but one of the crown jewels is the Navy Postgraduate School and what it does, not just for our, our country's national security uh, in basically training and educating uh, future of our officers who are there and only gonna stay in the Navy and basically get smarter and get better and get more educated and be a better warfighter. Uh, they contribute so much to the community, so it, it means a heck of a lot. So thank you for that and look forward to working with you on that. Um, what keeps me up at night uh, is definitely not the Navy Postgraduate School, uh, but it is the fact that sometimes people will lose faith in our democracy. Uh, to be honest with you. And uh, it's my job as a representative to make sure that government works for them. And that's why when you talk, we talk about the Chips and Science Act, when we talk about the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, when we talk about the PACT Act, when we talk about the Safer Communities Act, major bipartisan pieces of legislation that we passed in Congress, um, that gives me hope that we can actually make government work for people, that we're actually doing our job. But like I said, what keeps me up is that people turn on the TV, they turn on Fox, they turn on CNN, uh, they, they, they see the discordance, they see the arguing, they see the performance politics that are going on, uh, and people expect that out of me. Uh, and that's not me. My job is to serve them and to make government work for them, and, and I hope that we can con continue to do that. Just briefly, if anyone has a, a question they want to submit through the app, I hit refresh on, on the screen here. I didn't see anything come up, but it could be a technological problem. So if there's a, if there's a question, throw up a hand, and we'll try to figure out a, a we've got a few minutes left here. And I just, if someone had a, a question in the audience, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to skip over that. You guys are all missing the great Secretary Mattis line on this when he was asked in his first interview on what keeps him up at night. He says, nothing. I keep other people up at night. That's now that, right. that, that didn't have to be true, but it was, it, was, it was a great line. He was talking about the United States Marine Corps, by the way. Yeah. So, <laughs> when he said that. <laughs> it's just one of those, one of those great lines. Uh, just, OK, please, go ahead and shout, because it didn't come through on here. So please, go ahead. And I will repeat it so people on, at home can, can hear it. Great. I'll just repeat that for, 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 for people who didn't hear it. It's basically a question is, do we have a problem with retention? Do we have a problem with confidence, the public um, not fully sort of being bought in to what's happening? And uh, especially with regards to the service academy, so I'll just start with you, Mr. Navy Secretary. Sure. No, absolutely. Look, um, our, our nation's been at war for 20 years. Uh, I think that that naturally has an impact, obviously, uh, immediately following the attacks of 9-11. And I was in New York when the towers went down saw it firsthand. Uh, people were called to duty, felt they uh, had a commitment to make to their nation. Uh, over the course of those 20 years, that's waned a bit. And that's been a challenge, obviously. And I don't want to get into the politics of uh, you know, pulling out of Afghanistan or not pulling out of Afghanistan. But nevertheless, I think it's had an impact on the American psychic over the past 20 years as well, too. Uh, having said that, I think you know, the politicization of the military is something that's unhealthy. I don't think anyone should contribute to it, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or independent. You know, keep the service members out of it. You know, they serve proudly. Most of our service members, and I, you know, command close to 600,000 of them, um, men and women, they put up their hands, they swear an oath to their country, to the Constitution of the United States. They're willing to sacrifice their lives. And we ought to respect that. We ought to treat them with dignity and respect across the board. We should not involve them in this political debate. Uh, whether it's about vaccines or anything else. Don't use them as a pawn for political arguments. Uh, we owe them better than that. And that's what we ought to go back to. We ought to take care of them. I need your help recruiting across the board. 
make sure they join either the Navy or the Marine Corps, not the Army or the Air Force. <laughs> uh, but we need your help across the board uh, to spread the word. You know, too, too many of our service members now come from, you know, it's always historically been uh, across America in general, uh, too many of them now just come from families where they, you know, previous parents have served before. So there's been a disconnect between American society at large and the military, and that's not been helpful at all either. Well, on that upbeat note, if no, there are no further questions, I don't want to step on such a rousing sort of, you know, let's all serve and get together. I want to thank everyone for their time. I want to thank the Reagan Foundation, and uh, I hope everyone had a nice time and listened, and we'll see everyone else the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.